that's exactly where the panic attacks come from mm -hmm. because as an 11 year old my dad walks out of the door to go to a play and a, and a dinner and he never came home yeah. mm. what is up you guys welcome back to the number one mental health and addiction podcast the hopeaholics i am your girl natalie eva marie and these are my boys i'm chad i'm at shane earn baby hell yeah Brothers. Make sure you guys like, subscribe, and follow us on our socials and wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, new episodes dropping every Tuesday and Friday. Check them out. This episode is brought to you by The Infinity Group. You guys, if you or a loved one is suffering, please call us today. The number is right here on the screen. We are here for you 24-7. Now, let's get into the episode. Diaz Gomez, mm -hmm. so you speak mm -hmm. Spanish? Portuguese. Portuguese, I'm sorry. No worries. So Portuguese families are very strict. Most I'm, of the ones that I, I know. I'm Brazilian, though. Oh, Brazilian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. My family was not straight. No. <laughs> By any means. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the Brazilian culture, except my brother did visit there once. Mm -hmm. uh, we met a uh, family on a boat, and he went and he said, wow. Mm -hmm. That's all he said when he yeah, came back. He said, oh, my God. Just, it's whoa. a beautiful place. That's what sure. he said. He said it was just incredible. Everybody is gorgeous. 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 Mm-hmm. And the people are nice, and there was no windows. Very friendly. People. Very friendly, yeah, For yeah. Sure. I'm from Rio. Rio, yeah, nice. So one of the most gorgeous cities in the world. Yeah, for sure. yeah, high crime rate too. Yeah, uh, yeah, very much so. Uh, one of the main reasons I didn't like living there. And right. Moved to the U.S. Well, I'm reading a lot about the um, the poverty in Brazil, so I did I do know a little bit. It's really high. Yeah. Absolutely. And a lot of uh, in the government officials, a lot of um, corruption. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> very much so. Yeah. All right, sorry. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. This is Myra. Chad. Hi, Myra. Hi. Welcome to the Hopeaholics I'm podcast. I'm so happy to be yes. here. Yeah. We're excited to have you. Yeah. Are we ready? Yeah, yeah. we're live. Oh, yeah. Michael oh, Angelo, we I'm live? Surprised he didn't do your guys' music. Normally, you do your little dance. Oh, can you go ahead dance. really quick uh, before we get anymore. started? It's kind of it's kind of terrible. terrible. I mean, I don't know if I should. You over it? No. Never over it, baby. Never over it, man. I want to get funky. <sighs> he Love just it. likes. He likes that last part. That last part. We do yeah. all like that, the, uh, all that for the. Yeah, <sighs> yeah he likes that's the it. last. That's all I love. That's it. Like a nice, like you have a nice beverage. Yes, the a fresco. <laughs> I think I'm only gonna do the, uh, the 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 cue the intro on the Zoom meeting now because. Uh, You're right, because here we just roll with the kind of. Yeah, I want to. We're get, always I'm, on. I want to get everybody on the. I just want to get everybody on the Zoom meeting dancing because yeah. they like to do that. And sure Natalie do. doesn't dance. I so do she's too. going to. She's gonna dance. <laughs> dancing is great. She says dancing for her husband. Right? <laughs> That's I don't her know. Know. No? Probably not. No. All right. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, mm. Uh. Well, welcome to to the to the podcast. Yeah. Yes. So much. Such a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's, we're excited to have you. Yeah, it's an honor to have you here. Brazilian bombshell. I guess. Yes. <laughs> How long did you? Um, how old were you when you moved to the States? I was 21 years old. Oh, I wow. just packed up and came straight to Hollywood. Wow. Yep. What made you? By myself. Wow. Yeah. What made you decide to go ahead and? So I have a very interesting life story where I wrote a, f I wrote a book when I was 16 years old. Mm. Um, and I became a best-selling author by the time I was 19 years old. Wow. Um, my book was about my drug addiction and depression I was facing at the time. Um, I lost my father at a very young age, at 11 years old, in a car accident, mm. and uh, found out about his death through an online article. And so at a very young age, I became extremely, extremely rebellious. And uh, by the time I was 15 years old, I didn't want to go to school anymore. And uh, my mom was kind of like, what are you going to do with your life? And I was like, I'm going to be a best-selling author. Mm. And uh, insanely enough, I made that happen. And uh, by the time I was 19, I was working as a professional writer. Wow. Um, I started writing for the largest newspaper in Brazil and um, writing for several different magazines. So my life, my professional life started really young. But I felt very out of place and very depressed in Brazil. And uh, by the time I was 21, I said, I want to get out and I want to go to Hollywood and see what's out there. Wow. <laughs> do you have any siblings? I do. I have a sister, younger sister. She lives in London currently. And uh, I have three younger siblings, uh, oh, wow. older siblings okay. who live in Brazil. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
And what did your mom say when you're like, um, I'm out of here? <laughs> well, my mom's uh, very used to me being a very impulsive, crazy person <laughs> who makes a decision and just goes for it. Uh, and luckily, I have a very supportive mom as well. Uh, even though I make crazy decisions, my mom's always like supportive of me. Mm -hmm. So she supported it. Yeah. Yeah. And so you packed your bags, moved to Hollywood by yourself. <laughs> yes. Uh, where did you basically land up in Hollywood? So at first I went to a friend's house. Uh, somebody that I went to school with was was living in L.A. And I was going to be his assistant. <laughs> but I had no skills whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And that lasted like two days. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And then um, I, I worked as an interviewer at the time uh, for a newspaper in Brazil. And I had an interview with somebody that I was a fan of. Um, and basically, I went to interview him and we fell in love, <laughs> like right away, second night in Hollywood. And oh so I moved in with him within a week and just told my mom I'm not going home. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so if you That's fell awesome. in love. In That's awesome. I like that. That's a love story. Well, let's see. Well, it started off as well, nice. We don't know if it's well, a love it doesn't story matter. yet. It still is a I mean, regardless of the ending, it's still I feel a love like story. it is a love yeah, story. Yeah, I had the same yeah. situation. I really relate because you know, my father passed when I was in um, a car accident, a motorcycle accident. Oh, so I was sorry. I was 11. Oh, wow. And he was in a coma for 10 years. Wow. Yeah, I died on my 21st birthday. I'm so sorry. And my aunt sent me the news article, and that's how I found out. Oh my mm. God, we so, have very similar. So I was going to ask you, uh, but I was l I was older and I was kind of didn't see him for that ten and eleven years while he was in the coma. So how did you when you when you witnessed when you saw that? How did you react? And what was the next ninety days like for you? Right. So I was in like the second grade, I believe, either the second or the third grade. I was a really good student at that time. Uh, my dad was a very well known writer in Brazil, mm. so I grew up in an environment that was like very creative and very supportive. And I was always surrounded by art and books and uh, writing, pretty much. So I was a really good student. I was very intelligent. Um, and I had a math test that day. And I woke up and I was late. And I was, like, really mad that I was going to get a bad grade in my mm. math test. And um, I lived with my aunt at the time. She lived with us. And she was the person responsible to give me and my sister the news. Um, but the television network that my dad was a writer for actually told her hey tell the girls um slowly don't tell them everything because it was going to be all over the news and it was mm. going to be this really big thing um but i was smart enough at 11 years old there was such thing as the internet already mm. um so i logged into the internet to try to find out more and saw the article Gij Gomes, that was my dad died dies in a car accident i saw photos of the accident oh wow it was extremely traumatizing and I was very, very angry. Mm. I became very, very angry. I felt like betrayed. I felt like I wasn't taken care of. I was very mad that I found that found out that way. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So my reaction was to become angry. How about yeah. you? Yeah. Same. Similar. I, I was. I, I. I still don't talk to that aunt that sent me the letter. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Verna and Verna. Mm. <laughs> Whoa, jeez. Yeah. We might need to do some work on that. You think? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is, it's what it is, though. You know? Yeah, that's yeah. rough. That is rough. Yeah. Is, is that when your addiction started? Uh, I would think so. I think that's the event that kick-started my addiction because I actually have no history of drug addiction in my family whatsoever. Mm. Nobody in my family has a problem with the drug addiction. So I think for me, it really started from the trauma and from the fact that after my dad passed away, I felt like nobody can tell me what to do. Mm. Like, nobody. My mom can't tell me what to do. I just don't care. I'm going to live my life my own way. Yeah. Like, 11 years old, that was my attitude. Oh, so, wow. And I started using drugs when I was 14, so a few years later. Wow. Yeah. That is... It's just amazing how you have the... Um, the the uh, accident then you have the depression and it slowly integrates itself into your daily life mm -hmm. and then you start to numb yourself exactly and then i escape. found that you escape and i mm -hmm. found myself i had a girlfriend a different girlfriend every day i mean it was just that was kind of just not wanting to think not well, wanting to stay i relate to you a lot actually. not wanting <laughs> to stay in my own thoughts just yeah. always running to the next thing you were getting the dopamine from yeah, that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, that's what I feel. So I always tell people, well, like, my first addiction was boys. Yeah. Because I remember, like, a week after my dad passed away, being at church with my family, 
and just obsessively thinking about the boy in school who, mm. ha- who I had a crush on. Right. And that was the way that I found of escaping. Yeah. And so the, the boys really became an addiction, became a drug even before, you know, actual drugs. Yes, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I had similar situations. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah mm. That's crazy. Yeah. So you started at 14 mm-hmm. using. Yeah. And then, um, I mean, were you were you able to write your book at 16 still in your disease or? Absolutely. I was okay. I was drunk the entire time yeah so it started out with like uh, weed and drinking um but i was i thought drugs were were the most glamorous thing Mm -hmm. (laughs) because i grew up like a rock chick you know i was a rock kid i i loved bands i loved rock and roll and so i looked up to rock stars and i thought drug sex rock and roll that's Mm -hmm. what i want to be um and so drugs to me were very attractive and i think i was very shy so you know in terms of the boys at first, the boys really gave me um, a lot of feelings of like insecurity and there was a lot of rejection and competition. So being obsessed with the boys wasn't necessarily a good thing, right? It, it gave me all these like really negative feelings. Yeah. And I felt like I was kind of shy and insecure. And as soon as I started using drugs, I felt like, oh, OK, I can talk to boys. Mm-hmm. You know, so suddenly I have less inhibitions. Yeah. And I'm cool. Mm-hmm. I thought that I was cool. Mm. Yeah. And how long did that kind of last for you? Oh, wow. Like my teenage years were, were pretty much like experimenting with drugs. So I would be like, oh, I haven't tried this one. Let me try it. I haven't tried this one. Let me try it. And I wanted to try everything. And I would throw these like drug parties inside my own bedroom in my in my house. Wow. And I'd be the one throwing the parties. I can't say that anybody else was the, b- the bad influence in my <laughs> life. Like I was the bad influence on other people because I would watch, you know, movies like American movies and look up to rock stars mm-hmm. and read books about, you know, drug addiction. And I thought, you know, that's that's how I want to be. Wow. I want to be cool like that. <laughs> <laughs> and when were you like, OK, I need to get sober? OK, well, this, that, <laughs> a lot of things happened before that, obviously. So I've been sober for um, almost three years now. OK, it's going to be three years in November. Um, so, you know, I had like, what, 20 something years of alcohol and drug addiction. Wow. Um, and I experienced panic attacks through the majority of my life. Mm. Um, I had really, really bad debilitating panic attacks. And uh, it was during actually the lockdown where I feel like I hit my rock bottom Mm. um, because I was having panic attacks every single day. And I would feel like I wanted to kill myself every day. And I would wake up in the morning scared of that new day because I knew that by the end of the day, I was going to want to kill myself. Medical panic attack where you think you're going to die? Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really tough where you're just like out of breath and you're crying hysterically and nothing can calm you down and Mm. like my two thoughts used to be like i'm alone and nobody loves me and i want to die and they were like super irrational thoughts because i'm surrounded by so many people who care about me and love me but when i was having those panic attacks that's how i felt and i think that it got to a point where it was just unbearable and i knew that i needed to to get sober and that happened during the lockdowns wow okay backtracking to Moving to Hollywood, <laughs> falling in love the second day. Yeah. 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 Let's hear about that. Yeah. What was the guy's name? Uh, Coyote. Coyote. Yeah. Uh-huh. We're really good friends. Still. Nice. Yeah. Uh, we actually, see, it was a love affair. They're still well, friends. We're, we're no longer married, but like... Oh, we're, you got married? Yes. Wow. So I got married in six months. Wow. Okay. That's was awesome. married for 10 years. That's nice. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we're no longer married, but we're best friends now. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh it's a good story. <laughs> you know, as as relationships go, 10 years is a decent time. Yeah. And uh, after knowing each other for a week, that's a home run in my books. And they're still friends. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> Coming from a guy's point of view, right? 10 years. Sure. It's a long time. It's a long yeah, time. A yeah. Long time. yeah. Especially I got married so young. Yeah. 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 You and were, in Hollywood. Right. You were what? 22? 20, 22 when I got married. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That is really young. <laughs> that is really young. Yeah. Um. So I'm assuming during your your marriage, you were still drinking and using. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Living in Hollywood and working in Hollywood mm-hmm. and just living the Hollywood, Hollywood life, life that I came for. Yeah. Yeah. 
definitely whoa (laughs) yeah that's wild and so then i guess what transpired for you to end the relationship that's a difficult one um we went through some really crazy things uh very unusual things um my husband was my ex-husband was married to someone uh before me Mm. who um just hated me and had a huge problem with me and she just wanted to make his life miserable no matter what and uh, she would follow us around with a restraining order that she had and try to have him violate the restraining order so i kind of lived a nightmare for a few years where this woman uh kept following us around and eventually we went into a restaurant and uh, she was there and the police arrested him uh, for walking into the restaurant and so mm-hmm. <laughs> A criminal case started. Oh my I was goodness. in criminal court for a couple of years with him. Uh, he was convicted and he went to jail. Wow. And so I lived uh, through a really, really bad nightmare. And eventually it led to the end of the marriage. Mm. Very, wow. very dark story. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. See, Shane is not a love story. It well, is. It was for her, but not. Yeah, it was sad about the lady. I mean, it, it was in the sense that like I... I was there for him the whole time, you know, th- for me, this was like somebody trying to take away the person that I loved and mm-hmm. it was really, really difficult. I was really, really young and I lived through a process that I had uh, no understanding of at the time. I was so young and I'm in the United States now in criminal court um, and having a loved one go to jail is something that I don't wish on anybody. It's like the hardest thing ever. How anybody far into can your relate. marriage were you when that happened? like seven years seven oh years deep yeah and we we lived a very happy life like we really didn't have a lot of problems yeah that is wild it was more of like a, a tragic ending i think yeah yeah oh so okay. you were not ready for that answer. i was not <laughs> that is that is definitely knocked my socks off in the sense yeah. of um rome wade and juliet you know, mm, I don't know about that. They were separated by other circumstances. Yeah, but Romeo and Julia were like separated because they're families and stuff. True. I want them to be together. Yeah, you're, well, this was another like lady. Another. You're right. That's. I just played it in my mind. You're right. Yeah. No. Yeah, but it was somebody trying to separate us, no matter what, and we yeah. didn't want to be separated. And then, like going through that as like a twenty-something-year-old, mm-hmm. and just you know being in men's central jail three times a week at oh. that age, mm. and living through like the most absurd dark circumstances that i never imagined i would have to live through yeah and so uh, that was in dang seven years so you were already married for seven years and this was going on and then this i guess the the court case started Mm -hmm. so of course you're you're 11 your father's taken from you you felt feelings of abandonment you're full of anger and now 10 years later 12 years later Mm -hmm. the love of your life is taken from you with another circumstance exactly your protector your savior and now he's behind bars you're you're feeling alone again Mm -hmm. Uh, you spiral oh my god absolutely and that's exactly where the panic attacks come from Mm -hmm. because as an 11 year old my dad walked out of the door to go to a play and a and a dinner and he never came home. Yeah. Mm. So growing up, I had this fear that when somebody walked out of the door, they would never come back. And that's where that's when I would have panic attacks would be when I was by myself. Mm. And then suddenly I found myself in that situation. But in real life where he was about to walk out the door and not come back and he was going to be in this really dangerous situation. And I was just going to be worrying about him 24 seven, but not in an irrational way, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> like for real now. So everything's very much connected. And the fact that I continued to have panic attacks, it was like I was re-traumatized yeah. by this this thing that happened later in my life for sure. What is that called? What kind of trauma is that? Complex PTSD. Is that? No, no. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Wow. Yeah, that's actually yeah. wild. So then year seven of your marriage, you're going through this. He gets convicted. He goes uh, to jail. How long does he have to... Is six he out months. now? Okay. Yeah. So six months. So now six months you're um, living on your own. Basically. I'm living on my own. And that's when the, the drinking gets the worst mm-hmm. and the panic attacks get the worst. Exactly for that reason. Because I'm being re-traumatized by this. Mm-hmm. And not only that, just imagine going through the criminal process and the cost of the criminal mm-hmm. process. I mean, it literally obliterates your entire life, mm-hmm. yeah. you know. 
if you're ever involved in a criminal case, like just forget about it. It's gonna, everything, it's, everything's going to be taken away from you. So it's really, really tough, really tough. But I got through it. Yeah. So you made it the six months he goes and then he comes out mm -hmm. and you guys are still together. You are still together. And then I think that I felt like I sacrificed so much of my life. You know, I felt like I spent all my time and my energy and my money, everything in trying to save him that I wanted his full attention. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be the center of his world. I wanted to be like a princess. I want you to spend all your time doing everything for me now. And he was dealing with the trauma of having been in the cell for the past six months, you know, and he wanted to go out. He wanted to go to clubs. He wanted to go drinking. He was dealing with his own shit. Mm -hmm. And eventually, like, I couldn't handle it anymore. And that's when you decided, like, okay. That's when it started to, to end. Yeah. And then you went ahead, filed for divorce. Uh, yeah. So it was it was a little bit more difficult than that but yeah we initially uh, got separated and uh it was very it was very difficult to um detach from each other sure if, if i can put it that way because of the whole trauma as yeah. well mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and you were so young actually going into that relationship too yeah so and i'd never lived by my, i had never lived by myself at mm -hmm. that point so the fact that i have panic attacks when i am by myself and now suddenly I'm living by myself after having lived through all of this really heavy stuff. It was really, really difficult. And I was drinking a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then where did you end up once you got out of your relationship? Where did you land? Okay, still so in that's, Hollywood? I'm sorry? Still in Hollywood? Yeah, I'm still in Hollywood. Oh, you are? Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay, okay. Um, that part is very interesting because I was extremely depressed. I was living by myself for the first time and I actually started watching WWE mm. wow. and I started watching the women's matches mm -hmm. and started falling in love with wrestling and looking up at the women and thinking they're so beautiful, so strong, so powerful. I was like, I admired the women so much. And uh, I felt very lost at that time. And I was trying to find something to reinvent myself with. I had worked as a journalist in Hollywood for those past 10 years. That was my main job. I was an entertainment journalist. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to do something different. <laughs> and I literally looked up at the TV, saw, saw your girls, and was like, how do I become a professional wrestler? And Googled that. Yeah. Um, and saw, you have to go to wrestling school. And so I searched for a wrestling school, wrestling school near me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Found a wrestling school in Vegas. Uh, and two days later, I moved to Vegas mm. wow. to go to wrestling oh, school. Impulsive. Okay. Always impulsive, Always. right? I mean, it's the dopamine that you're yeah, seeking. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah. And so um, so that's what happened after the separation. I moved to Vegas and went to wrestling school. Wow. Um. Uh, went through the whole thing was not an athlete by any means so everything was extremely difficult sure, for yeah, me yeah yeah um i was trying this thing that you know was way out of my league <laughs> right 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 but i was in love with it and i i fell in love with how difficult it was yeah and i think that it really helped me like build back my strength sure. and like resilience and pride yeah. you know being proud of myself for what i was doing um I was there for like six months. I was like living in the hotels in Vegas, but I was still drinking at that time. Mm. Eventually went back to LA and thought, you know, what are you thinking? You're not going to be a professional wrestler. <laughs> um, but then at that time, uh, Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins, yep. who owns the NWA, yep. I'm sure yep. you know yep. him as well. Yep. Um, I had been in the Smashing Pumpkins music video. And uh, so I knew Billy and I knew him from the music industry and being a Pumpkins fan and everything. Um, he came to my Instagram and he saw that I was in wrestling school mm -hmm. and my bio said future star of wrestling because yeah. that was the name of my school. And I was wearing a Smashing Pumpkins shirt in the ring, like Amazing. all things aligned. Yep. Crazy. And uh, he asked me, like, are you wrestling? And I was like, no, not really. I'm in school. Uh, haven't had a debut match at all. Uh, but, you know, I'm studying. I, I want to be a wrestler. Yeah. And he's like, oh, well, you want to come work for the NWA? And so he hired me and I started working for the NWA. Wow. <laughs> and that's where I went after that was my next wow. chapter. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. That's wild. <laughs> yes. How long did you do that? Or are you still doing it? I'm still in the NWA. Okay. Yeah. I've been there for four years. Awesome. I'm their backstage interviewer. Oh, nice. Yeah. 
Okay, so you're no, no wrestling. No, I'm, so I became the interviewer, which nice. was which was my career before. Yeah, okay. but now I knew about wrestling, yep. so oh. I could do that. Way easier on the body. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> way easier. Smart girl, smart, <gasps> very smart. Um, that's incredible. Yeah. But I mean, I I do love the determination of. Yeah. I mean, I remember I, I'm pretty impulsive as well, but my husband is very not, and he's tamed the beast big time because... That's why it works. Oh, I, that's exactly why yeah. it works. Um, because I would definitely... Oh, I want to do this. And then literally the next day, I'm, I, there I go. I think that's great, though, but uh, the, uh, the if if that's your dream, I, I, don't know, I don't know that I call it impulsive. I call it just, like, going after it. Yeah. Just, like you know it's life. both things at the same time it is yeah. like you know you probably you came to hollywood to live the hollywood dream yeah and, and everything sure i wanted you, worked out i mean I'm, i started I'm, working as a music journalist mm -hmm. and i'm sure you had been thinking about that since a child yeah right mm -hmm. coming to america what i know about brazil and i don't know if this is true or not but i hear i heard that there is like 10 10 women to every one man so there's a lot more women in brazil than i don't know are. if that's true is oh, it i don't know from yeah yeah i mean it could be true maybe <laughs> i don't know i don't know that we'll have to look it up yeah can we'll you look to, it up we'll have, to ask, we'll, have to, <laughs> we'll have to ask google or michelangelo <laughs> i have not been to brazil I, I i wanted to go to brazil uh for um when i was single for the reasons that you want to go to brazil <laughs> when you're single right uh but now that i'm married i don't know if i want to go to brazil <laughs> why not just go with your wife <laughs> Oh, I would, definitely, I would definitely take my wife. Yeah. Home no, home choice. Brazil. Yeah. no choice. No choice. Wife wouldn't let you go alone. No. No. God. Donna, no. Donna ain't letting you go to Brazil no by yourself. Are you kidding me? Shit. Yeah. I can. I yeah. No. Let's see. What does it so say? So I'm wondering, um, your dad's one, high. one female, the value of entire population, and that, that doesn't help. No. <laughs> 1.1 um, 1 .1 to 1.7. So it's pretty even. Yeah. That sounds even. So I feel like yeah. your statistic is very off there. Way urban off. legend. Yeah, yeah urban exactly. legend. Yeah. That's how they. That's how they entice the uh, American men to, go spend, like yeah. right? spend, to yeah. go spend their money in mm -hmm. uh, in Brazil. Yeah. I do like the Portuguese language though, <coughs> mm -hmm. and I did date a Brazilian uh, woman uh, when I was single. I hear that a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did. <laughs> It's fact. How was it? Um, it was great. Okay. Yeah. She was a little possessive. But As Brazilians are. <laughs> <laughs> South Americans. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So then now you live in, in Hollywood. You're still um, an interviewer for NWA. Yeah. Um, have you fallen in love again? Uh, yes and no. Mm. I have a very hard time falling in love nowadays. I think that I am so healed and my standards are so high that I have a really hard time opening up to people. And um, I think that's a good thing because I'm very aware of like what I want and what I need and what my boundaries are. Like I, I didn't understand about wants and needs and boundaries before I became sure. a sober person and now I really do. And I'm not really as willing to waste my time in, in like meaningless relationships mm -hmm. so i think that i have a really hard time connecting with someone and when i do i find that they're normally people who are emotionally unavailable mm -hmm. so it never really goes anywhere and i think maybe that's my problem falling in love with emotionally unavailable people right <laughs> but i think that's good you know to have your your boundaries and and kind of almost like your list yeah because it's like why waste my time I'm just like not even like interested yeah like you know unless like it really checks off all my boxes mm -hmm. and I'm just like so busy already and I already have so much to do that in order for me to like dedicate my energy to someone I really have to believe that that person's worth it for sure yeah. and I really do believe that your partner is um so important in your future mm -hmm. it can they can either make you or break you in a sense because obviously if you link up with somebody that is not the best for you then you're obviously not going to soar your like life you derails completely mm -hmm. and then you've lost so much time and you know i'm already like in my 30s mm -hmm. i don't want to waste time right 
if I'm going to be with someone, I want it to be someone that, you know, is really going to add value to my life mm-hmm. and going to treat me properly. Right. When, at what time were you, when did you make the decision? Because obviously you've already gone through so much. So when were you like, okay, I need to get sober. Like this, me drinking and, and using is not yeah so that was during the lockdowns because i was living by myself and i was drinking a lot and like i said i was having panic attacks every night and wanting to kill myself every night Mm. but i've i've been lucky because i've I've had a therapist for like seven years so i've really had you know that kind of support and my therapist has always said to me you have to get sober you have to get sober but i never thought that it was possible Mm. i was always like that's impossible i'm never going to be able to not drink it's part of like everything in my life but at this point she was kind of like you know i i demand you to get help now like this isn't some suggestion anymore and uh she referred me to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist pretty much said to me um okay um if we get you sober we might be able to stop the panic attacks and i was like what like nobody in my entire life has ever told me that it was possible to stop my panic attacks and Mm -hmm. you know that was like my my biggest struggle i was so afraid of my Mm -hmm. panic attacks and he's like, yeah, you know, if you stop drinking, we might find that the panic attacks are connected to the alcohol abuse and it might stop your panic attacks. And I think that for the simple fact that I suddenly had hope, mm-hmm. you know, talking about hope, um, that was enough for me to want to try. And then he put me on a medication called the Comprisit. Um, and that medication really, really worked out for me. And I've been sober ever since. And I stopped having panic attacks. I no longer have panic attacks wow amazing what kind of medication is that is it like what's the one that you can take that makes you violently ill if you have a drink yeah that one's no good no that's not the one which uh, what's uh, that one called i can't think of the name i forgot the name but i know which one you're speaking about but no this one didn't make me sick at all (laughs) excuse me it was really really good for me actually what's it called again a compressit you guys might want to put that up on the screen if you yeah, what is want to know more put about it, it. Put it up there so that we can see like what it does for you. AC. AC. Yeah. R. Compressit. R I S I T E. Yeah. There you go. Alcoholism medication. It can reduce the desire to drink. Uh, go deeper into it because I want to see what the uh, what the actual. Uh, a drug it is that's in it. Um, go go up higher. Uh, yeah, back up to the top. Oh, Campro, that's what it's called. Yeah, I know Campro. A compressate, but it's called. It was called the, the yeah the the brand name was Campro. It, uh, it's probably a generic. Oh, yeah. lucky you with the drugs, with the yeah, with the drug. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, really, really they don't always out. work on I everybody. Yeah, it, good it, for you. It, that one is you needed that. Mm-hmm. That that one is one that yeah. um, shuts down. It's kind of like uh like how the semaglutide shuts down yeah. people's desire to eat. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay, um, so it kind of shuts down that receptor. Well, it reduced it very much. I wouldn't say it like made it go away right away. It was it's obviously been like a really long journey, mm-hmm. but it really reduced. Um, the my need for yeah. it, the craving or the urge or the desire. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering, while you were going through it, did you think the drinking was helping you with that pan- with the panic and the anxiety? Were you leaning towards it even more, or did you kind of know already? You know what, the drinking's kind of. I didn't think that the drinking was making it worse. I didn't understand that. Okay. Drinking was just part of my life. Yeah. You know, everybody around me drank. Yeah. Every activity I was involved with involved alcohol. Every relationship I'd ever been in with alcohol. started with alcohol. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you start dating someone, you go out to a bar. Yeah. You know, when you, you, you're you dating someone, you go out and you drink and you go to parties and you go to dinners and you drink and you meet up your friends and you drink. Yeah. You go to a concert, you drink, <laughs> you know, so like everything in my life, you know, alcohol was a part of. Yeah. So I wasn't really thinking like alcohol is making this worse. Mm-hmm. It's like everybody drinks, especially in Brazil everybody drinks and there isn't really like a culture of of recovery like there is here you know like (coughs) excuse me sobriety isn't really like celebrated you know and that's something that i struggle with nowadays that i'm super uh, public about my sobriety because i feel it's very very judged right Mm. 
people don't want to admit that they're alcoholics. They're like, no, I drink. There's nothing wrong with it. I agree. I used to always think that as well. Like, yeah. I never wanted to, I guess, be open about my addiction or my alcoholism just because of the, the, the stigma, stigma of maybe... I mean, it's obviously all in my own head because no one really gives a shit, but um, of a sign of weakness Mm -hmm. of something, you know, when in actuality, which is funny how God works, because now I'm sitting here, you know, with the dream team over here and all we do is talk about sobriety. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of funny how God does. And you're proud of it. now. I am. I am. It is. It's become my superpower because I know for sure if I wasn't sober, if I didn't seek recovery then i wouldn't i'd be either dead in an institution or in jail mm-hmm. in an institution i mean i'd be in a straight jacket yeah like for sure <laughs> um they could have put me in one a couple of times you know I no but i it. definitely understand your hesitation to do it especially you deal with like the aspect of the the public opinion so much and wrestling fans they can be so harsh too for and sure. there's probably a ton of wrestling fans that really love drinking drinking yeah. sure and and the, but the the thing is is that the, there's there, there there's this other part of the stigma right there's the stigma that sometimes oh like people look down on you because um you you you, you they might think that you're weak oh you can't just stop mm-hmm. you can't mm-hmm. just stop drinking um or like it's your choice you did that right. for your yeah. own life mm-hmm. yeah they that 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 one i see a lot me like, too on i get those comments social on media yeah um I mean, I, I, got, I got it from, you know, the reason why the Hope, Hopeaholics podcast is, uh, exists is because I lost my son-in-law to fentanyl uh, I'm o- very sorry. Over, overdose. And like, and I'm public about it and I post about it and um, uh, I get comments like, like he's dead. Like uh, you don't have to, you know, stick the knife in yeah. any further. But my the other part of uh, the 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 stigma though is sometimes people think that because we're sober and they drink that we're that we looking are judging, down, oh, that right, we're right, judging right. them yeah. and i don't judge you if you if you don't not have at a, all i don't even judge you if you have a problem if you have a problem and you want some help uh, I'm, here. I'm here yeah, bro. i'm here yeah you are if you can drink and get up tomorrow morning and go to work and not beat your Good wife. For you. Yeah, yeah, I'm like party hats, on. Yeah, yeah, my hats off. <laughs> Lucky you. I not mean, not beat your wife. Not right. be an asshole to your yeah. uh, employees or your or kids. your boss yeah. or or your kids. And you're loving and you're kind and drink away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I hang out with friends who drink now, and I have no problem with that either. And people are generally like. Oh, is it okay if I drink next to you? And I'm like, please, like, live your truth, mm-hmm. live your life. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, I'm past that point. Yeah, I don't. I am okay desire. with whatever you do. I, I, I do notice though, and and I'm not judging my friends when I do this. Like the people that in my life that drink, when I, when they, when I first get around them and they haven't had a drink yet, they're well, totally normal. Oh, okay. like they're, they're like, and then I start to see the drink going in, and then. Everything gets a little I bit love looser, you, and then I they love want to you, talk Chad. a little bit more. And I'm like, "Fuck, that's the alcohol talking." Yeah. It gets really annoying really quick. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> that's the. And then alcohol. you that's still try to be a good friend. Yeah, I'm like that's when I'm yeah. exiting the building. I'm like, bye. But sometimes you're stuck, though. <laughs> yeah, especially if it's like family. <laughs> Just roll your eyes. Like, oh damn, yeah. how long do yeah. I have to be here yeah, for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you um, did you seek recovery or were you was it the medication and then you were like okay so it was i i was actually uh not in the program initially i was watching meetings online but Mm -hmm. i wasn't really participating at first because we didn't have any physical meetings during lockdowns right 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 um but i was watching meetings uh on zoom every day and um i had uh, you know both my psychiatrist and my therapist um checking on me weekly so i was lucky to have that support for sure Mm -hmm. but i think that mostly it was the medication but then also um in my first month of sobriety i decided to come public about it because i felt that um if i told everyone about it i would be obligated to holding myself Mm -hmm. accountable Mm. You know, I would feel like a responsibility to stick to my word. It would be ridiculous if I went on Twitter and said, I'm one month sober and now I'm not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I know that when I when I say things out loud and when I'm public about them, I hold myself to a different standard. So I think the fact that I immediately told people I'm an alcoholic and I'm going to attempt to be sober now 
helped me. Yeah. And uh, I immediately got so much support that I didn't even expect. You know, that's another thing. Okay, there is the aspe- aspect of people judging you. But at the same time, there is so much support For once sure. you once you come forward and say, no, I'm an alcoholic and I'm struggling and, you know, I'm, I'm looking to become sober. You know, it's such a huge community, the recovery community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so many people immediately became so proud of me. Mm. And then I felt like a, I felt proud of myself and I wanted to keep that feeling going. Mm-hmm. So I think that I... I did it for myself, but I also did it, you know, for the people watching. Yeah. And that helped me. Yeah. I, I like I like recovering out loud. Me uh, too. You know, I like, uh, you know, it's, uh, and I will say it's always been different for me because my whole career since I've gotten sober was working in the, uh, the drug and alcohol treatment field. So like it was it's almost like a, it's a it's a bonus, right? It's a bonus for the clients that I work with. Mm-hmm. Uh it's a bonus with the family members that are looking to put their children or their loved ones into treatment because because you understand because yeah. and they know that I understand mm-hmm. and I can actually give the perspective to the families from the addict side mm-hmm. and um, show that they can change their life and that they can have a great relationship with their family again someday and that helps you I'm sure oh for sure and helping helping other people is such an important like component of sobriety as well I think that once you you're like blessed with sobriety and, and, and you, you know, you get the blessing of sobriety. It really feels like a blessing and you, you want to pay it forward. Yeah, for definitely sure. want to pay it forward. I mean, that's the whole part of the 12th, 12th step, step is giving it back. <laughs> Can't keep what we have unless we give exact, it away. Exactly. Right, Shane? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm wondering? I'm sorry. I, I'm just deep in thought here because she's <laughs> 11 years old. She lost her dad, who's yeah. a big time. You have five family members, right? Five brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. It's five of you guys. Mm-hmm. And you have your mom. Mm-hmm. What's what's going on? How does that, that, that dynamic change? And what happens to your mother? Yeah, so my mom was really young, actually. So she was in her 30s at that point. Yeah. She was in the car accident as well. Oh, <clears> wow. She, oh, she was in the same car. So oh. it was a taxi accident. Oh, damn. Um, mm-hmm. They had gone out of town to go to a play and a, and to have a dinner. Oh, shit. Uh, my dad was a play writer, a uh, very, very well-known play writer in Brazil. Um, he wrote some of the most famous soap operas of all time, wow. some of the most famous plays of all time in Brazil. My dad loved theater. And so he had been invited to a premiere in Sao Paulo, a different city in Brazil. <clears throat> and they went out of town to go to this play. Um, so it was a date night. It was like a beautiful date night. Wow. My mom was like all dressed oh up, beautiful. Gosh. They went to like uh, the most amazing Italian restaurant in town. There's like their last picture together. They're all like oh God, dressed really amazing. They're like <clears throat> having the perfect date night. Um, and my mom was in the accident. So it was, it was a taxi accident. Um, mm. The taxi collided against a bus. Damn. Yeah. <clears throat> so my mom comes out of that also very traumatized. <clears throat> And she was very young. So I feel like she was going through her own trauma as well. And maybe she didn't exactly know how to help me Mm -hmm. because she was going through it herself. But she tried. She tried very hard. And I think she really tried to be my friend rather than an authority because I had this aversion to authority. And so she would go out to concerts with me because I loved I loved rock and I loved music. So she'd take me out to concerts and she was an actress on TV. So I totally take advantage of that and say, hey, mom, sure. can you get me backstage at this concert? <laughs> so I was like 12 years old with my mom backstage watching The Offspring nice. and stuff like that. Oh. So she tried to be like like a friend, you know, and looking back, that was great. But also maybe that's why I, I just started doing whatever I wanted because I didn't really have authority yeah. in my life. But she was doing the best she could, you know, and... <clears throat> at first she wasn't aware that I was doing so many drugs you know it, it was only with time that she figured it out um and she tried lots of different things but anything that involved uh grounding me or demanding me to do something or forcing me to do something she'd get the opposite reaction from I ran away from home so many times and I ran away from school so many times I'd get drop off and walk right off the gate <laughs> so nobody could tell me what to do um so she had she had to she struggled with like being a parent and being a friend Mm. um but then when I told her that I wanted to become a writer and I wanted to write this book which was uh, my first book that was a bestseller 
she was very supportive and said, yeah, go for it. Write about it. And she helped me find the publishing company. She helped me get the publishing deal. Wow. And so she supported my writing career. And having started my writing career really was what, you know, got me out of the most of my depression because lots of teenagers in Brazil could relate to my book. Sure. And so, like, I found a new purpose. And all of a sudden, I was a teenager, like, going on talk shows to talk about drug addiction and stuff like that. Except that people wanted to know the, the lesson and the story or what my advice was. And I was, like, this 19-year-old girl still doing drugs. And, like, I don't know what the advice is. Right. I'm still doing it. Right, right. <laughs> what, what was the book about? So, it, it, was, it was exactly my story. It was a memoir disguised as a, as a fiction because I was afraid of getting sued by like all the people i was talking about sure 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 <laughs> uh, but it was about a girl who loses her dad in a car accident yep. and, and gets involved in the world of drug sex and rock and roll wow and so a lot of teenagers could relate to it mm -hmm. and it kick like kick-started my writing career yeah which is huge because that obviously has led i mean you were when you moved at 21 you were a journalist right yeah so and I worked here like, as a journalist for 10 years. Yeah, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. Dang, that <laughs> is wild. Um, for your recovery now, do you attend any like AA meetings or any kind of 12-step program or no? I feel like I don't go as much as I should. Mm. Um, it's very occasional to be like if I'm being really honest. Yeah. Um, but I but I am very close to my sobriety and <clears throat> I, it's very important to me to be close to my sobriety. I'm, I'm still counting days. You know, and um, I started work, not working, but I started more uh, engaging as a speaker. So, you know, the fact that you guys invited me here, I'm sure is a consequence of the fact that I have been trying to more and more speak publicly and <clears throat> do different events and do different things. So I feel like being active and, and, and talking about it and helping people is how I'm working at it right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You found it, right, Shane? I saw How her. How did you find yeah, it? Yeah, you know what? I saw you on a magazine. Okay. And I read a little bit about you and I found was it. Was it recovery today? It was. Okay. Yes. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. Yeah. How are your five brothers? How are your three brothers and your sister doing? Uh, my sister, my younger sister lives in London. She's doing really well. She's pregnant. Shout out to oh, my wow. sister. Good nice. Wow. Uh, the three boys in, sp in Brazil? Uh, so it's two guy, two boys and a girl. Um, they're actually in their 50s. Oh, really? Yeah, because I'm... I'm from my dad's second marriage, mm. so mm. they they are much older than me, um, and they're all musicians. So one oh, of my brothers wow. is a jazz musician, the other one's a drummer, and uh, my sister's an opera singer. Wow, <laughs> talented family. Oh, yeah, man. we're all artists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you sing? Well, kind of. Oh. Oh. These, are great. These are great mics. <laughs> These are really good are mics. Can, can you sing? No. <laughs> no. Can don't you don't no. She can. No, I cannot. My boys. Uh -oh. You got a good voice. No, I do not. Do that intro. Um, no. Your girl here, Natalie Marie, with my boys. That's not singing. Chad and Shane. Yeah, it is. You're kind Shane, of, you're, you're, crazy. you're holding a I tune. I do not. I have zero. Shane, can, if Shane, a Shane. gun okay. was put to my head, I'm going down. You're probably going to die. Yeah. If it's like... <laughs> Sing your heart out at uh, your best and going Sh down. Shane. I love singing, but I'm, I don't think I'm confident enough yet. Shane, uh, really? can, Shane can yeah. sing. You guys can uh, bust out a tune together. Do you know any songs? Uh, don't do Vera either. I sing. Shane. I like to sing. I feel like we should skip the singing. All right. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, guys. Wow. All right. Uh, but it fun. is is singing something that you would want to pursue? Oh, my gosh, yes. Like I wanted to be a rock star my whole right. life growing up. And then I eventually started writing about rock stars. Like, that was my main job. Like, I worked interviewing bands for the majority of my life. And, um, yeah, I always wanted to be the one in the band. Mm -hmm. But I had, like, a lot of stage fright when I was younger, mm. which I've had to get over, obviously, with wrestling. I was just going to say, <laughs> I'm, like, stepping into yeah. the wrestling world. You yep. got to get over that real quick. Right away. Yeah. <laughs> you have no sure. choice. You can no just choice. get thrown into whatever Sink situation. Sink or swim. Yeah. 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 Now, we I saw something like. else on your Instagram. Oh, there was something with Playboy? Yeah, what I did Playboy that? earlier this year. Okay, now, now what I'm wondering is this. How is sobriety and Playboy, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? It's a lifestyle. Playboy, in my eyes, it's kind of a lifestyle. Uh, I see it very differently. Okay, yeah, explain, yeah. give it to me. Uh, when I had, the, well, I've worked as a model yeah. also my whole life. Uh, and when I got the opportunity to be on Playboy, 
I saw Playboy as a promotional tool that I could use mm. to brand myself. Nice. So I thought if I have Playboy branding behind me, that opens a world of opportunities that I didn't have before. And I don't need to do Playboy and, you know, stick to modeling or get into the adult industry or anything that I don't want to do. I can do Playboy and use that to become a speaker, 100%. To, to release another book, to become a host for a television show. Yeah. The fact that I was on Playboy makes people want to contact me because they say we have our guest, <laughs> Playboy model, sure. Myra Diaz Gomez. And that's what I've used it for. For me, it was a business opportunity and a chance to, you know, make my brand more well known. Yeah. So that's what it is. That's for awesome. Me. Yeah. Yeah. What were you thinking of? No, like, just play, to me, it's a fast you? paced life. You know, uh, modeling, photography, um, Playboy. It's just, it's a different, it's a lifestyle. Yeah, it is. And um, a lot of the girls that are on Playboy live that lifestyle 24 7. Yeah. Uh, but I think that I am different in that aspect where that is not you know, my ending goal. Yeah. You know, no, no, you're very smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very smart, shrewd, impulsive. But, um, when she takes a chance, she knows she's going to get it done. Yeah. Like that's the thing. She's, she has that confidence. I have vision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have that vision mm -hmm. and then you have that confidence. Good for you. Thank you. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And then after Playboy, I did FHM also. And then eventually I was interviewed by Forbes Morocco. I was yeah, on the I cover of Forbes yes. Morocco. Nice. So it had, has nothing to do with Playboy, but no. I got it because, because i was yeah, on playboy yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then i also did cosmopolitan yeah so you know my business vision actually worked out 100 percent. yeah yeah good for you thank you and good i like I, I have lots of magazine opportunities lined up if i want to do them in the next year as well and all of the all of that came from being on playboy mm. how was that experience uh, being on playboy it was great yeah yeah i mean I, i'm used to modeling i've i've modeled since i was really young and when I was 22, I was actually <clears throat> in, a, in a magazine in Brazil as well called Sexy Magazine. So I had done that before, uh, but in Brazil. So it wasn't much different. Mm. And like I said, to me, it was just, you know, a, a, a business plan. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Getting more eyes on yeah. the brand. Exactly. Which is, you are the brand. Exactly. I get it. Smart. Yeah. It's right, it's right up your alley. Well, not the Playboy, but I mean... <laughs> Well, why not? Well, maybe no. I didn't. I I didn't mean that in a bad way. I, anyways, let's not even go there. I, I, We're gonna have to call Jonathan on now. Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking too. I just got you we just can't made even, me nervous. And no, but I like that. We can't even uh, comment. No, no we can't. I like that because I I feel like too, um, especially in the industry, it's like you are immediately put into a category, and that's only where you're supposed to stay, mm -hmm. and that's what you're supposed to do. Whether it's like. If you're an actress, then mm -hmm. you're kind of, you know, always plain, very like no makeup, no whatever. Or at least that's what they told me. And that's just not me. So it's like if you want to do multiple things and you love doing multiple things, why not? Yeah. And, you know? and that's what I feel like my my message is, you know, you don't have to be one thing. You can do this and do that. You can do multiple things because you're not just a... You're a multifaceted person. There are so many aspects to your personality. And who says you have to stay in that box? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can use my sexuality, but I can also prove that I'm extremely intelligent. Mm. And why am I not going to do both things? Why do I have to only be sexy or only be intelligent? No, mm -hmm. I don't. I can do anything I want. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I love that. And uh, clearly, I mean, the fact that you're an author wrote a book at 16. At 16. It's amazing. I've, I've published Sane. four books so far. Four. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's amazing. It's incredible. Yeah, it's. I confuse people a lot. <laughs> people always think like they have me dialed in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're yeah. like, "What? What? What?" Yeah. The more they find out, the more they're like, "Yeah, it's nice." What? Mm -hmm. No, that's good. That's a fantastic quality. Thank you. That's amazing. And the fact that you went through so much at such a young age is sometimes, or at least from from what I've seen too, with like you know people in the program, sometimes it's. Not only is it very difficult, but it's easy to get stuck there mm -hmm. because it's very much a uh, uh, easy excuse, especially when you're a child, to continue to just stay in that pain of losing your father and not really growing from that. Mm -hmm. Because obviously once you start to get older and then you're in your, your 20s, you can't live there anymore. because No, you're, because you're, it's going to bleed out into all of your relationships. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. you have to work through the trauma in order to evolve. 
Mm-hmm. And then I think that sobriety gives us that opportunity. You know, with, without sobriety, it's not really possible to work through the traumas, I believe. Yeah, because you're just burying it. Exactly. I agree. Yeah. And then more is going to obviously happen because... You and and more gets revealed, too, because uh, sometimes the trauma is so deep that you don't even realize how deep it is when you are not sober. Um and it's just that surface stuff that's really hurting you, you mm-hmm. know, and, and you keep and you keep masking it with the substance. And then you don't know why your relationships are going wrong. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know? Mm-hmm. you know, you attract what you are. You know, it's like uh, if I'm drinking and using, I'm, I'm probably not going to I would have never landed my wife. Mm-hmm. Right. Never. Same. All I could do is work. How for long have you guys been sober? All of you? I'm uh well I've been in the program since 1996 but wow. I currently have six years sober. Okay, I have ten and a half. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. And Shane Thank hasn't you. smoked crack in 12 years. Fifteen. Fifteen. Sorry. God. Amazing. 15. God damn. But I'm normal okay. now. I'm a, I consider myself enormous. So I'll have a drink. I'll, I'll smoke okay. a little bit of weed if I want to. But crack, crack was your problem. Crack was my problem, and I feel it was a mental health issue. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I solved that mental issue for myself, that craving went away. Mm-hmm. I, and I still suffer from depression. I'm on Lexapro. So I have, you know what I mean? I, I, and you're able to, to drink socially? I don't drink anyways. I'll have a, oh, I'll okay. have a half a drink every month. I don't enjoy it. I never did. Oh. Um, I was never that kind of person. Uh, the crack, when I tried it, just kind of <laughs> took me hold of me. Because you had the trauma as well. Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. When I drink or use, I blow things up my entire life. So I'm very i feel like because i i got into the program when i was 23 and then had a couple i got three years and then i went back out thinking you know i'm I'm a normie or i can do it Mm -hmm. um and clearly i was with my heart rate going through the roof hi really Mm -hmm. wow like abnormal heart rate i like that um but I know for sure is like one of those things where I'm, i'm happy that that did happen now looking back just because um I have enough fear in me of going back out and never making it back in. Same. You know? I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I do too. I feel like uh, having a healthy amount of fear just because I know how dark it can get. Yeah. And I know how difficult it is to get sober again. And I don't want to. I'd be so scared that I could never do it again. Exactly. Exactly. And you know how much you've gained Mm -hmm. in sobriety. Mm -hmm. I'd be so scared to lose it all. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I feel like I would be disrespecting God by giving me such a gift mm-hmm. and throwing it away just off of nonsense. Mm-hmm. So, um, but you've been in NWA for four, four years, four years. Mm-hmm. Um, how often are your guys's promotion? Uh, we film like every couple of months. Yeah. Uh, so we have like a pay-per-view coming up and then we have a set of tapings. Okay. Um, we started out in a studio in atlanta but now we go everywhere so we have our pay-per-view in cleveland ohio okay and uh we have our tapings in nashville yeah and and nwa is growing yeah yeah i've I've loved working there and uh, i've learned so much from wrestling like i mean like just work ethic Mm -hmm. and how to you know uh handle myself in different situations you get thrown into so many Mm -hmm. situations that you you don't think you're capable of going through and then you you go on camera and you do it. Yeah. Um, and just like respect and so many things that I, I've learned from wrestling and becoming a speaker, you know, learning how to speak on the mic. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I just love it. Did you ever have um, a match or did you go straight into just like your interview? I had a couple of matches. You but did? I never became really good at it. Okay. Not like you. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, uh-uh. I would like, not compare I'm like, myself. I'm like, your, your smart interviewing is amazing because you're always on TV. So yeah. that is always a plus. And then you're... You to remember a lot. That is true, too. And, and you have keep to know up what's with all going the story on. Yes. <laughs> you have to know exactly what's going yeah. on in between everybody and the feuds and everything yeah. like that. So, yeah, it's... It's very difficult. Like hundreds of different storylines. For sure. Yeah. And all of the kind of nonsense that has to be spoken about or yeah. asked about. Exactly. So that is another kind Title of changes task changes. Completely. <laughs> so. Have you screwed that up live? No. No? <laughs> no. Um, are your. Are there any matches that are live? Yeah. Are your guys' matches live? Pay-per-views. Yeah. They are? Okay. Yeah. We had uh, 
one uh, live NWA power, actually, okay. in which I had a wedding. Okay. <laughs> um, I was supposed to marry Aaron Stevens, but he left me at the altar. Mm. <laughs> and I destroyed my whole wedding. Yeah. Nice. As wrestling weddings. For sure. Are. That's usually how they go. That's my favorite day yeah. ever, at, ever at the job. So yeah. uh, do you have a character name? May Valentine. Oh, yeah. I saw that. Yeah. I saw that. I, re- I remember. Yeah. May Valentine. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Are you a, um, a journalist right now for a specific magazine or publishing company or no? Uh, no, um, not really. Um, this week, actually, I just, <coughs> excuse me closed a deal to start hosting a paranormal show whoa (laughs) so that's where i'm going next Uh, i'm gonna start filming it in december it's called escape from the paranormal okay um and it's like a reality show game show type Mm -hmm. of thing in an asylum in new york city wow (laughs) whoa and uh i suppose the losing team has to sleep and stay in the asylum so that's what i'm doing next That'll be fun. Yes. <laughs> That'll be exciting. And you're hosting it. Yeah, I'm the host. So I don't have to sleep in the asylum. Yeah. Thank God. That'll be cool. Yeah. I was going to say beautiful lady, smart. What's like, what's big next? So that's big next. Yeah, that's what I'm doing next. Um, I'm also working with AXS TV. I'm going to be uh, one of their commentary people on, on a new show called Metal Mayhem. Uh, so I'm focusing music more. show music show nice yeah I, cool. I'm a metal guy me too Iron Maiden Guns and, I'm going to Guns and Roses I just got the me ticket too. for the bowl Hollywood Bowl yes you, are yeah. you an American Express holder <laughs> I couldn't get the ticket <laughs> what the nope, hell I'm a Capital One I'm a Capital One preferred holder oh, so shit. yeah I, I went early <laughs> I tried to get it I couldn't get yeah, it yeah 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 <laughs> yeah but yeah so i'm focusing more like on on screen hosting now because i did many many years of like writing yeah. mm-hmm. and uh i feel like now it's time for me to like be on screen yeah so it's the next step yeah it's exactly. the obvious next level obviously i can write and i write most of my scripts yeah. and everything uh which is no AI, huge, by the no way AI. which is like already no way i times a million ahead of people mm-hmm. because yeah. and also too i feel like that's um such a good quality to have especially because we do live in like a, a social media era so being able to write is important because mm-hmm. what do we do you write captions you write tweets yeah you write posts you you have to write you can't just yeah and i'm like i'm my own publicist so like a- every mm-hmm. magazine and everything that i've done this year i i got it myself and i write my own stuff and i send out my own stuff so i have a big awareness of that because I worked in entertainment journalist for, for all this yeah. time. So I handle all my stuff myself and write all my stuff myself as well. Yeah, that's huge. That's amazing. And then not only that, but you going into being on on camera, whether it's hosting or interviewing, makes sense because you all also have come from doing NWA, which is great mm-hmm. because, as you know, especially in wrestling, you get thrown into the fire real quick. Oh, yeah. And you have to learn. That's literally the our theme song, Into the Fire. <laughs> exactly. By Dokken. Sure, you know that one. No, I don't. What? I thought you were a metal guy. Go sing it. Let me hear it. I don't He's cool. lying. We're not going to be singing on this podcast. All right. I tried to get her, guys. <laughs> not Dokken. <laughs> <laughs> That's not where we're testing my voice. <laughs> that is crazy uh, but yeah no wow. for sure and like uh, in a taping i'm basically doing like sometimes 40 promos in one day yeah like people don't understand the amount of work mm-hmm. sure. like i'm in front of the camera sometimes for like 12 straight hours just going one promo after the other after the other that i i got the morning of the show and then I, i'd had to look over it and go on camera mm-hmm. so it's like people don't understand that especially so when it comes work. to like the wrestling world uh because obviously fans and everything get to see like the the aha and like the final product when you see is like glitz and glam and everything's yeah. amazing but a lot of the times like whether it's matches or promos or, or things you're getting handed right before you're either going out yeah. there to give a promo like literally things, right before yeah or things are getting cut and you're having to you know take so out. much as improv y- yep so i feel like it's a really good um kind of i don't want to say the starting ground but if you can handle that job you can do anything. You can do so much, so many other things. I agree. I agree. It sets you up because you already have had to deal with something that not the average person yeah. is able to do. Yeah. And for me, like I've had like Billy Corgan behind the camera directing me for like two years. So when he, when he initially put me on the job, like I, I'm, I'm not going to say I was great at it. I was not, 
you know and i was still understanding wrestling because as you know wrestling is really complex you know there's there's so many parts to understanding wrestling and so for two years i had billy corgan behind the camera directing me and so i'm really grateful to him because he made me do it whether i was ready or not Mm -hmm. and like now i am Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. that's huge because that's like an amazing mentor to have kind of guide you through that process exactly which then now gives you the confidence to go into and step into what you're about to do yeah i mean i'm so grateful to billy yeah 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 shout out to billy shout out to billy just for someone to take a chance on on someone else you know he felt something Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he felt something Mm -hmm. yeah it's huge i love that yeah sometimes you just need you need someone to you all everybody needs somebody that's it yeah he was definitely somebody that believed in me when I didn't even believe in me, mm-hmm. you know. So he helped me get to where I am today. That's for sure. Yeah, it's incredible. And the fact that like I was a big rock fan and loved the Smashing sure. Pumpkins was in the Smashing video. Pumpkins music yeah. video, and then like he's the guy that comes and and like changes my life. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. Yeah. How's Coyote doing? He's doing great. <laughs> Shout out to Coyote. Shout out to Coyote. <laughs> yeah, that's so you guys are good? Friends. They're friends. Yeah, like really good friends. Like he's he has a girlfriend. His girlfriend's cool with me. I'm cool with her. Wow. Yeah. But I was actually talking to your girl in the car. Uh, Brooke. Brooke who drove me here. Um, and I tend to become really good friends with my exes. And I, I know that that's not like something common for everybody. But I feel like when I love somebody, like my love never ends. It just changes form. Mm. And I'm not sure if it's a quality or not, if it is that I can't let go of people Mm. or that I have the quality of being able to transform the relationship. But I tend to become like really, really great friends with my exes. And they're like the people that I text for advice with the people that I'm dating. Wow. (laughs) You know, or like they're the people that I'm going to call when I need help for something. And I feel like they are the people that I'm the closest to, really, in my entire life, are people that I've dated. Wow. Yeah. That maybe that'll change when you meet a husband. Yeah, yeah maybe he won't like that you shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I don't talk to my exes. My wife just would, no bueno. Are you kidding me? If Jonathan was texting his uh, You'd beat ex, him down. What do you do? You'd kill him. For advice, um, we want to be married. God, right? No. Well, but I'm single, so yeah. exactly. Yeah. No, no, totally. So yeah. that's why it makes sense if you say yeah. like maybe it'll change once you get married. Yeah. yeah. Because obviously, once you get married, I feel like it. it but does. That person would have to accept that I have a good relationship with my exes. I feel like I don't need to be texting them all the time, obviously, but like they're always going to be like in my friend yeah. in my life in some form. Mm. That's how. As uh, a friend, I, I'm I'm uh, still really good friends with my ex-wife, okay. and I'm remarried. Uh, and how does your wife deal with that? Oh my my uh, my wife is fine with it. They it, I don't know that they liked each other in the beginning, um, but they like each other now. Uh, and my ex wife works two doors down from this right here. Okay. <laughs> so I see her every day. Okay. Um, yeah. She's mean. <clears throat> mean to Shane. Oh, she. Is it only me to me? No, she just doesn't like you, Shane. God. Yeah. But like that situation is a little bit different because you guys do work together. Well, I mean, uh, Donna, no, I but I was going to, I was going to also say though, that Donna, um, was best friends, like best friends with her very first boyfriend and the first love of her life. Um, and she always had a rule that, uh, in, with the, any guy that she dated that he's her best friend and you have to, you're going to have to deal with it or we're not going to even mm-hmm. go past this point. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't have to deal with that because he died before I oh, met wow. my wife. Wow. So, Oh my God. Would you have been able to? Um, I think most of the time I, I would, um, unless, uh, unless we're fighting and then, then I'd probably bring it up and use it as like some kind of stab back or something. See, that's not good. That's not healthy. I'm just being honest. Yeah. No, I know. So the answer is no. Yeah. I would be okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's not what you said. Not, yeah. I love this guy. Yeah, no, I, I, what I'm saying is, yeah, it would bother me a little bit. But yeah. if that was, if I, if I love somebody uh, enough, and we, and I had already committed that, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Because she would have said, you know, date three, uh, you accept this, or we yeah. don't go, we don't go beyond this. 
And if I accepted it at that point. Well, she was upfront about it. Yeah, right. always. She was always upfront with her boyfriends. Yeah, I do After say that, that to people when I meet them, too. I say, I'm friends with my exes. Do you have a problem with that? Yeah. And I want to know if they're friends with their exes. Because I think it's also a red flag if they talk shit about their exes. Oh, I do, too. I don't, I don't, I think, like, talking negatively is... Well, if you're holding on to a resentment... Yeah, exactly. ...of, like, your ex, that's an issue. Yeah. That's a problem. Because there's two to tango. So, clearly, like, at the time... And if you have to think of it, I always look at it like... And that could be you next right yeah, well not only that next. but it's like well clearly they were good enough for you to date them for an extended period of time and then once that expired then now it's well then she became psycho yeah. that's you know that's like, what I don't know, the guys say oh she yeah. that, but then she became psycho yeah, she, she got crazy too, yeah, she got crazy yeah. Yeah. Psycho. but what kind of stuff were yeah, you exactly. doing to He's cause like, her oh, to I become was just psycho sleeping yeah. with her best friend yeah like you know? no really like what kind yeah. of stuff were you doing to cause exactly. her to become psycho mm-hmm you know, love does some strange things to people. Yeah, that is true. So, Myra, what are you doing now? The panic attack, the panic attacks have subsided. Mm -hmm. You're not drinking. You're in sobriety. Mm -hmm. You're living a good life. Mm -hmm. What are you doing for your mental health recovery on a daily basis today for, for the people out there? that they Exercise. Exercise. I mean, that's I one of the, that. the most important things, I think. Um, I mean, I would say that wrestling was a, a big part of it because that's when I was going through my separation and <clears throat> panic attacks and mm -hmm. depression. And the fact that I was doing something that was so, so, so physically hard mm -hmm. uh, was part of why I was able to get out of it, you know. And so I really learned that I have to stay active no matter what. Um, I mean, you have to get the serotonin and the dopamine. Totally. Uh, if you don't get that, then you're looking for it elsewhere right because like as addicts we're always going to be looking for that yeah. <clears throat> so that's number one i think and uh i'm also like very spiritual i do a lot of like meditation i i light my, my candles mm -hmm. like gratitude candles and i think writing is also can be also very spiritual yeah. journaling um and doing these these speaking types of things as well and i don't know just being focused in work and and in evolving constantly and looking at myself and analyzing myself and always trying to grow. It's a beautiful full plate. Yeah, it is. You know, mm -hmm. she's really put together. Mm -hmm. I mean, been through a lot and you really got yourself together. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. Strong woman. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I love We're going to introduce her to World Shakers. Nice. Yeah. Are you going to find my next husband? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we can introduce you to a few people. Shane, are you gonna play matchmaker? Well, I'm not good at that. No. I'll do my best. Okay. I have a few single guys friends. Yes. No wrestlers. No. <laughs> wrestlers. Wrestlers. On the road too do you much. wrestle? I I I like to wrestle. Yeah, not gonna lie. I would have been a wrestler. Would you? Yeah. I don't know. If once once you get a taste of just the travel alone, mm. it's know. tough. It is. It's a hard to schedule. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if there's some closing We're, words, yeah. what would you like to finish with? That that feeling you want to give off to the people here. We're going to do a, a short reel for the ending. Um, we want to reach some community. Well, I think if you're struggling, the most important thing is you're not by yourself. You're not alone. You know, once you admit you have a problem and you decide to <clears throat> come public, you decide to do something about it, there is so much support available to you. The recovery community is such an accepting and, and loving community. I think that, you know, you just have to open up to it. And it's not going to be easy. It's going to be really hard, but it's going to be worth it. And I think that the longer you're sober, the more blessings you receive. And I think that's something that generally everybody who's been in sobriety agrees with. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you achieve things that you never thought were possible. And I just want you to know that there is so much hope and that you can do it. And I believe in you. I love it. And if someone wants to get a hold of you? Um, you can get a hold of me through Instagram or Twitter. Myra Diaz Gomez. Nice. I love nice, it. Nice, yeah. Thank you so much yeah, for Yeah, thank on. you. Thank you guys yeah. so much. It was great. You're a bright light. Beautiful. Bright light, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Amazing. Nice. All right. Picture time. Pictures.